Hi. My name is Walt Wingerfeld, and I will be discussing the second part of the conservative management of thoracic outlet syndrome. The objectives of part two uh, are discussed really the evidence regarding the most effective conservative management strategies, as well as integrate the learned information with a case example. One note is that we will not be going into detail um, with the medical or surgical management of TOS, but this may be worth exploring on your own to have a better understanding of the alternative options. Addressing postural factors, if possible, may be one of the most important considerations. In this picture, you can see an excessively depressed and subsequent downwardly rotated scapula, or the depressed shoulder syndrome as we discussed earlier. Other than the excessive traction this may put on the brachial plexus and decreasing the costoclavicular space, it may create late or insufficient upward rotation of the scapula, particularly with overhead movements. This is most noticeable in abduction as it's often the most provocative shoulder motion. There are a number of ways to appropriately retrain the scapula and I would advise taking a look at the Watson part two paper referenced in this presentation. For the purposes of having a broad understanding Think about just trying to retrain the scapula to rest in a normal position without overly retracting or posteriorly tipping will get the patient going in the right direction. Once this is established, then you can add a little more creativity in adding motions and trying to train the appropriate movement pattern. The lower trapezius, middle trapezius, and serratus anterior all become important muscles to generate that normal force couple. One other note is that there is some suggestion that adding external rotation may be a provocative maneuver in some patients. So be aware that if symptoms are being provoked when exercising scapular musculature that involve external rotation, that you may be tensioning structures within the scalenes. Improving thoracic mobility is also very important particularly if the limiting factor is stiffness versus muscular endurance. Forward head position also feeds into the excessively protracted position we mentioned earlier, and you will often find stiffness at the CT region. Oftentimes with these postural impairments, you may find adaptively shortened musculature or musculature with increased tone or trigger points. There are a number of techniques to use and for the sake of time we won't go into specific detail here but general stretching, contract relax techniques, and dry needling are all options in these cases. Taping is another intervention that may be effective particularly in the short term. This picture shows an axillary sling technique that is designed to create some elevation and upward rotation of the scapula particularly in those patients that benefit from elevation of the shoulder girdle, such as the releaser that we talked about earlier. In the picture to the left, the symptomatic side is the right side and the tape actually extends into the axilla to create a little bit of the lifting effect. I have also used some other taping techniques that just provide some feedback to the patient, particularly those that are in bad positions for long periods of time throughout the day. Both taping techniques, again, are short-term solutions, and obviously other areas should be addressed here. Also, some females may need to wear more bra support, which is a relatively easy fix that could supply some good relief in certain populations. There are many variations and positions for first rib mobilizations. The seated position is one I use quite frequently. The hand position is just lateral to the T1 transverse process while laterally flexing the cervical spine toward the affected side with slight extension and rotation toward the opposite side. A contract relax technique is often, often used in this position where the therapist, in this case, would rotate the head to the left 
and extend slightly to help engage the barrier more firmly. Once that end barrier is reached, you could continue to mobilize or just provide a quick thrust if the patient is appropriate. The technique is designed to glide the first rib caudally, and there's some question as if this changes the costoclavicular space through biomechanical mechanisms or through, the neuro, or through a neurologic uh, response. I'm not sure if we really have a good answer for that right now. We know the spinal mechanisms work predominantly through the neural circuitry, and in the, per and in the periphery, this may be a little different, potentially. Regardless, reassessment is a key feature to let you know you're going down the right path. If not, then focusing your attention to other outlets, so to speak, may provide better symptomatic relief. There was a nice case study by Brisme that outlined a detailed PT regimen for suspected thoracic outlet syndrome. And what I liked about it is that there was a constant reassessment and specific subjective and objective markers used for each. These are some other mobilizations that indirectly impact the mobility of the first rib by focusing the force at the costal vertebral joints and the costal transverse joints. You could simply slide the hand over to the first rib to direct the force more locally if you so choose. This is a nice study by Lloyd in 2014 out of the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy. And it's really looking at what is the best landmark for um, mobilizing the first rib. And essentially what we saw in the paper is that a really good reference point to just lateral of the T1 transverse process onto the first rib is actually the mastoid process. Um, they found essentially that the width of the C1 vertebrae and the T1 vertebrae were equidistant. So sliding off just where the mastoid process is uh, provides a good reference mark that, that may help um, improve your palpation findings for the first rib. Once we've mobilized the first rib, just like any other manual technique, you want to prescribe the exercises that simulate or are best adjuncts to manual interventions. In this picture, the patient is focusing the intervention toward the scalenes. This may be indirectly mobilizing the first rib if there is suspicion of spasm or increased tone in the scalenes. In this case, the patient provides the caudal force to the towel, to the towel toward the opposite hip while retracting the chin and side bending the cervical spine away and rotates toward the affected side. You may see in the literature and some text that the best way to maximally stretch the scalenes is with opposite rotation, giving their action is thought to be ipsilateral rotation in some cases. Nevertheless, the technique just described can and will produce a stretch in the scalene region. To really target the first rib, the rotation should be in the opposite direction. Think about the circle rotation line of reflection test. Rotation to the opposite side. Um, rotation will be opposite toward the effective side. We mentioned earlier that the Syriax release test is something that we can use to help sniff out what we call the releasers or those that tend to have more pain and paresthesias at night due to relief of compression on the neurovascular structures. The thought from Syriax is that pain and paresthesias occur when the nerve trunk or cord is first compressed, then returns to a normal sensation after some level of adaptation. When pressure is released, symptoms may reoccur for a period of time. Although the mechanisms are unclear, there could be some changes to intraneural microcirculation or axonal transport. This technique can be replicated in the clinic as an assessment by grasping under the patient's elbows from behind, 
with elbows at approximately 90 degrees and maintaining neutral position in the forearm and wrist. Slightly lean the patient posteriorly and elevate the shoulder girdle. And re reproduction of the paresthesias is considered a positive test. There's a modified version that was used in the Brisme study referenced in the slide where a foam pad was used instead of having the clinician manually apply the elevation similar to what's seen in the picture to the left. The study was performed on an asymptomatic population without a known TOS diagnosis and had the highest specificity at approximately one minute which really imp improves our clinical utility. At home, the time it takes for symptoms to appear may take quite a while and may not occur completely within the first few weeks, but with consistency, the time before onset of awakening should tend to gradually increase. The mobility of the shoulder girdle is also an important area to address. Having limitations in in ray motion of the glenohumeral joint may lead to diminished costoclavicular space, so mobilizing at end range may be necessary rather than in a standard position. We all know the relevance of the AC and SC joints to normal scapulohumeral motion, and there's thought that if the clavicle is hypomobile, it may move too quickly in a dorsal direction with elevation, which may compromi compromise the costoclavicular space. Addressing the scapulothoracic region may be necessary, one, for relaxation purposes in some patients, and two, to help facilitate normal motion, and is a good position to help retrain normal scapular muscle activity, um, potentially with some PNF patterning. Adverse neural dynamics is often present in those with TOS, so addressing the neural sensitivity may be a big component of the treatment package. The ulnar and median nerves are often the times, are often the areas um, of focus. Be aware that in many cases, in addition to entrapment in the proximal outlets, there may be entrapment in more distal areas, most notably the cubital or carpal tunnel. So depending on where you feel the neural entrapment is may help you choose where to mobilize. And in the picture to the left, the clinician is mobilizing proximally by first caudally gliding the first rib and maintaining that position while gently oscillating in a lateral flexion um, with the other hand. It's imperative to understand the patient's irritability before performing um, any technique, but particularly important here. If you find that laterally flexing toward the effective side isn't taking symptoms off, then you're either being too aggressive or it just might not be the best technique for that patient at that particular time, especially if they're irritable. Distal neural mobilization is focusing on the ulnar or median nerves in a slider type of fashion may be a better option, particularly if you suspect a distal component. Last but certainly not least are several other often overlooked components to treatment. In those who have had significant spasm or tone in the scaling regions or those who chronically have excessive accessory muscle use for breathing, um, which we see in our COPD patients, then some simple breathing techniques may be very efficacious techniques to reduce that tone. When we look at those with contributing factors from work, we can spend treatment session after treatment session working on their impairments, but if they aren't making attempts to change the factors they're stuck in over the course of an eight hour day or longer, then we may not make much ground. Educating your patients on exactly why those changes are critical might help to motivate those patients to change in some cases. We can also look to sleeping positions as potentially aggravating. Sleeping prone or with the arm overhead likely will be an aggravating position in this population. If the patient wears pajamas, then pinning the sleeve of their shirt to another part of their clothing may keep them out of those vulnerable positions. And the power of positive expectations is 
huge. This isn't really specific to TOS, but given the emerging evidence on how expectations can affect outcomes, it probably isn't a bad idea to always find the silver lining in the patient's presentation. Good news is that we have several studies that show really good outcomes with conservative care. Along with diaphragmatic breathing, these positive thought processes may help decrease anxiety, thus potentially uh, neural sensitivity. I wanted to share a case study that might help to bring some of the material together. This was a 45-year-old female who was a certified hand therapist. First off, I think this goes to show you how tricky this can be because if you know any CHTs, they really know the upper extremity well. Her interpretation of her problem was cervical radiculopathy based on some C6-7 issues that honestly could have potentially fit her symptoms. Um, she was mildly to moderately overweight and enjoyed spending time at the lake with her family for recreation. Her NDI score was fairly low at 16%. She had a 10-year history of a variety of right upper quarter symptoms, but not spe no specific mechanism of injury. The severity of symptoms were moderate and irritability seemed fairly low. She did report awakening at night with paresthesias, but was able to return to sleep after a short period of time. And no other red flags were present involving vision, swallowing difficulties, balance impairments, or clumsiness with her fingers. In her objective exam, there were essentially no reflexive, dermatomal, or myotomal problems. Both elbow and shoulder were clear. She did have a drooping shoulder position as well as a moderately forward head. Scapular musculature was impaired. Cervical motion produced some of her medial scapular symptoms that she complained of, and there was a painful limitation to her cervical rotation lateral flexion test, but did not have any particular bony or firm infill, so it was somewhat of an equivocal finding. There is a fairly significant limitation of full elbow extension with median nerve upper limb tension testing, as well as with the ulnar nerve. Mobility assessment reproduced her medial scapular symptoms and supraclavicular symptoms at C7 to T1 were pretty stiff. Her first rib also appeared to be stiff and reproductive for familiar symptoms. Scaling length on the right was pretty restricted and less so on the left. And pec minor length was normal. So, I felt this in fact may be related to, TO, to TOS and chose to mobilize the first rib, which did not change her cervical rotation lateral flexion test, but seemed to improve her first rib motion. There was a positive change in her pain as well when assessing this region, but no change in cervical motion. I also chose to thrust the CT and upper thoracic regions, but didn't change any symptoms. I gave her a first rib self-mobilization as a day one treatment. There appeared to be some positive changes with sitting after the initial visit. And when we assessed the first rib, there, was na there now appeared to be some more conclusive findings. Since we had some positive changes the first visit, the same treatment was repeated, but CPA and UPAs at C7 and T2 were added, as well as manual neurodynamics. Her medial scapular symptoms diminished as I continued to mobilize, which I felt was a positive finding and improving, improving neurodynamic response. Didn't see as much response in the ulnar nerve which may have been due to not spending as much time here. On visit three, things 
continued to improve, so I, I kept things similar to treatments one and two, but added a contract relax technique to address her scalene impairments, which seemed to change her symptoms once again. Her cervical rotation lateral flexion tests appeared normal post-treatment. And since she was getting some symptoms at nine, I thought I would trial her with the Syriax maneuver for approximately 20 to 30 minutes prior to bed. On the next visit, her symptoms continued to improve and she was getting less pain at night. She appeared to have no deficits with neck motion or her cervical rotation lateral flexion test, but there were still some mild limitations in neurodynamics. I decided to focus on the contract relaxed techniques and neurodynamics since there were still um, the areas where symptoms could be stemming from. I made some modifications uh, to her home exercise program as well. On the fifth visit, approximately two weeks later, she seemed to be doing really well. There appeared to be no significant limitations. Again, the patient was a CHT, so I didn't have to spend tons of time demonstrating exercises, but suggested some scapular work that she should probably start incorporating into her routine, which she could do very independently. There was minimal disability at this time, so I decided to discharge her and have her call back if her symptoms return. At two months, I called her back and she seemed to be doing really well. Um, we talked about her exercise progression, but otherwise there was no plan to follow up. I felt she progressed better than expected and thought there would be more ups and downs in the process, but at least for now, she had a pretty good outcome. I hope this lecture was informative. Um, the big take home points is that TOS is really a diagnostic challenge for all the reasons that we have covered. Since we have difficulty actually defining exactly what it is, and there are no true gold standards as most cases are non-structural in nature, it can be seen as a very ambiguous presentation if you're not aware of the signs and symptoms. Again, there are two general types that we um, think about with TOS, uh, vascular and neurogenic cause, with the um, latter by far being the most common. And structural abnormalities are common in the thoracic outlet region, but generally not symptomatic. We have some level three evidence um, in the literature, but we rely mostly on level four and five for guidance. So, my advice is to really broaden your perspective when examining patients and not getting getting focused on structure, but realize that more than one issue could be going on here. Treat your impairments and continue to reassess. Overall, there's a good prognosis with conservative care. These are a list of my references. And thank you for your time and attention.